Hello and welcome to the Functional Tennis Podcast with me, your host, Fabio Molle. Every week I speak to the big hitters in the world of tennis, both on and off the court, about the game and how we can all get 1% better every day at what we do. As an ex-national team player, I know exactly how tough this can be. So I'm on a journey to get the very best tips and advice from the world of tennis. Last week on the Function Tennis Podcast, I spoke to Dr. Dario Novak, an associate professor at the University of Zagreb and a member of the coaching team for Stan Wawrinka. In our conversation, Dario detailed what Donna Vekic and Borna Korge were like as juniors when he began his strength and conditioning journey. I asked Dario about his work with Stan Wawrinka and his previous work with Elena Rybakina. And we also spoke extensively about Dario's research into what makes a top tennis pro and a slam champion. Really interesting his work there. We had a fascinating in-depth conversation, so I really recommend going back and listening to the episode. This week on the podcast, I meet one of the top juniors from 2022, who has recently turned pro, Jakob Menzik. In 2022, Jakob, as a junior, won four Futures titles. He also had a career-high ITF number two. He got to the final of the Australian Open Boys Singles event, where he lost to Bruno Kazahara. In the final, he suffered with cramps nearly four hours into the match and he was forced to leave the court in a wheelchair. He couldn't even make the presentation. But overall, his performance get to the final, his junior results throughout the year have made people take notice of him, including Novak Djokovic, who invited Jakob to train with him personally, and he tells us all about it. Jakob has recently turned pro and has a very bright future ahead of him in the game of tennis. In our conversation, Jakob tells us all about his famous 2022 Boys Open singles final and what it was like to train with Novak Djokovic. I also asked Jakob about how he's dealing with all the media attention and what the jump from junior to pro was like. But before that, I want to know exactly where in the Czech Republic he's from. Jakob, welcome to the Function Tennis Podcast. How are you? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your invite. Yeah, I'm feeling really good. I'm now at home and uh, yeah, I'm in the preparation mode before other tournaments. So yeah, feeling, feeling very good. Where exactly in the Czech Republic is home for you? Uh, I'm uh, living in Prostyov. It's uh, my hot- hometown. And uh, yeah, here is uh, one big tournament. It's uh, World Junior Tennis Finals, maybe, you know, under 16, under 14. And uh, one big uh, challenger, one, uh, 100. So yeah, it's pretty small city. And uh, yeah, it's in the centers, in the center of Czech Republic. So. Nice. And uh, did you pl- were the were the under fourteen world championships on when you were maybe three years ago, three or four years ago? Did you yeah, play? Yeah, yeah, I, I played it like twenty nineteen, so it's four years ago. How how did you do? Pretty good result for us because you know that we are a small country. We have like not enough players, uh, young players to play tennis. These uh, these years, guys are like uh, we were we were good teams. So with the with a good coach. So yeah, we're gonna go back to your early days, but first. As a 14-year-old, were you like one of the best 14-year-olds in Europe? What sort of level? I know you did well in the tournament. But just tell me, what was your level back then compared to other juniors? Were you top? Were you not interested in ranking? What was the mindset back then with regards to ranking? I started to play tennis Europe after I was like 12 or 11, maybe. This was my start because the uh, these tournaments were something different because I didn't play in Czech Republic and then start, started to play uh, all around the Europe. In Czech Republic, the tournaments only create Czech Tennis Association. I, I was I was like pretty good. I mean, I was like second on, or first in my age. And I, then I started to play around the Europe. I think... Under twelve, I was, I was like top top ten maybe okay. top ten. Then I started to play uh, higher and higher tournaments, and I started to be better and better. And uh, under fourteen and under sixteen, I was placed top top three for sure. I think I enjoyed this part of my uh, development a lot because there are. A lot, lot, of, lot of guys and players that I knew before. We became friends and yeah, so it's like good memories. And who do we know that played those tournaments back when you were 14? Or who's in your age group, should I say? 
you know, Dino Prismage is like my uh, my rival because we played a lots of lots of lots of uh, matches and we we were also like now in ATP ranking we are situated both like uh, someone is like 10, 10, 10 places before and uh, also the Alex Blocks he now won the uh, Junior Grand Slam Austrian Open twenty twenty three. You want to throw this back a few years? Where did tennis actually start for you? Was were your parents tennis players or coaches, or was it just to get you keep you out of trouble? My parents were both are like they they like sports, and uh, my my dad was uh, he was playing uh, ice hockey, and my mother was skiing. I, I started to play tennis because of them. In front of my house, there are like two tennis courts. I was always watching players who were playing there. And I was saying, oh, yeah, I like that and I want to try it. And yeah, then I started uh, because uh, in our Prosio, it's like the biggest national tennis center in Czech Republic. So uh, I have a good opportunity and it all started when I was like four or five. And I started to play with uh, some some coach, uh, Ivo Miller. My parents were want want to play some some sport yes do you remember the day where you says i'm all in here mom and dad i want to be professional tennis player uh, and yeah, you stepped yeah. it up when was that it started when i was like 11 12 when i started to play like uh, more around the world and i started to realize that i'm pretty good in tennis and uh, i can be like better and better i can i have also here uh good coaches and good people around me so yeah, I was uh, very lucky from that point. So, yeah, I must say like 11, 12, that, that was the starting point. And did you start playing more? Were you practicing more, training more? Did you just go all in? Were you still in school? Did, how, how long did you do school for? Did you finish school? I'm still in school, but the school is like I'm going there like when when I'm not on the tournaments or when I'm not practicing, when I have like day offs. The main thing, it's, it's tennis. I'm now in the middle school. When I started to be more professional, the school moves on uh, the lower lower levels. I'm now more focusing on tennis. Oh, look, it's still great that you're still in there. So that's really good. Yeah, and, for sure. And uh, who did you look up to? Who were your Czech hero tennis players? I always uh, watched Davis Cup in the TV. And with my dad, uh, we were watching Thomas, Thomas Berdych and uh, Radek Stepanek. The, these guys were like legends <laughs> in uh, in our country because they won it twice. Tom, Thomas was my like um, tennis tennis hero when I started, but it's something different than than, than my idol. And the idol is of course who else than no, Novak. So <laughs> as a, as a young kid, what what was your actual dream? Once said, okay, I'm good enough to go pro here. I want to dedicate some time to this did you say okay i want to be the best in the world what was the initial dream there the main goal or my dream was always to be the best in what i'm doing when i started to play tennis and uh, realizing that i can be uh, like one one of the best and that i have that potential it, it was my dream to be the one of the best and uh, winning grand slams and uh, the big tournaments and of course be be on the tour as long as I can. Okay, well, then we're going to talk a bit about your junior career. But before we get to the, the famous Aussie Open boys final, uh, which was challenging for you, before that, what were your what were the main challenges you had getting to that stage of your career? Was there any big obstacles you had to overcome? Four years ago, when I remember my f- first tournament, I started uh, to have more and more experiences to uh, be be a part of better tournaments. First year when I was junior, I told my coach that I want to play like all Grand Slams juniors. And now it's my last year and I'm <laughs> I'm playing adults. My first Grand Slam was uh, was US Open. When I saw everything, the the club and uh, all all the players, I realized that uh, that's the point why I'm playing the tennis because I want to be here on these places. So it was a big motivation for me to, to be better player. I, I was in the third round and then other Grand Slam was uh, Australian Open Juniors 2022. Then that uh, that. <laughs> 
that uh, stupid thing happened yeah, in, the, in the finals. So T- Tell us exactly. Obviously, you went into full body cramp. You were on the court, face down. You looked dead out there uh, from the pictures from the pictures I've seen. Did you know this was happening? Like, was a four was a four hour three setter final, wasn't it? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's not about just the finals, but uh, also the the matches before, because you know it was my like first tournament that I played in these uh, very hard conditions, and it was really really tough because there were like. 35 degrees every day. The good thing was that uh, that uh, that I lost in in the trial gone uh, early. Then I r- realized after uh, I was winning like four or five matches, I was feeling that my legs are like, w- w- what the hell is happening? So in the Aussie Open, everything went pretty good. It was my like biggest result. But when I when I was on the court. This happened, and uh, yeah, let's go, go move on. I was playing in the Rod Laver Arena. It's a dream of every player to play there. Yeah, it was pretty tough because uh, day before I played three sets match uh, in uh, 35 degrees. So uh, that day in that finals, I was feeling really like tired, and but uh, still I felt that energy because it was my first final. After three hours, because we are playing six, seven, six, six, seven, six, seven, so uh, it was unbelievable. And uh, in in the third set, uh, after after two sets, uh, we played like two two hours and forty five minutes. So it's unbelievable. And then in the third set, I, I felt that uh, my 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 legs and the arms and the whole body is starting to like. Uh, saying stop it's enough for us but you know it was final so i was pushing pushing on and yeah after after like five all or five six um, my my body was absolutely dead in this point i i can't remember what happened there yeah it was also very emotional and uh, physical it it was so hard for me i was uh, recovering for four hours in in the stage I, I felt pretty pretty bad, but also still believing that <laughs> I can win in that moment when I was serving and the, the cramps were everywhere. My my coach uh, told me that if I'm gonna stand like only uh, just staying on the court, not not laying, maybe I will win. But no, no, no. It it was uh, it was it was very tough. Yeah. Well, it's it's a, it's yeah, it sounds it and it looked like a very serious situation. Yeah. And how long did it take to recover after? Did it take you a few days? What did they do? How did you recover? Did they put fluids into your IVs or how did you get back to normal? Yeah, immediately after the match, they put like ice on my legs and uh, something for cramps, some juice or I I don't know what. But uh, you know, for for this situation, is best uh, option just to do nothing <laughs> and just uh, waiting after the cramps were gone. And stuff after that, uh, I opened the ba- ice bath, and it was the <laughs> was the na- nice thing uh, ever <laughs> after after this match. <laughs> Overall, it was a number like you're in this pain. But also, look, you've got to the boys final at the Aussie Open. It's a big accomplishment. You were number two in the world then. When did you make the decision to go pro after that? Did that help you go pro quicker? Yeah, for sure. Because our plan was uh, to uh, play the Grand Slams and to to go for higher and higher results on the Grand Slams. But the, my second Grand Slam was the finals. And after finals, is also only the winning of the tournament. We wanted to... To also try to play Roland Garros and uh, and Wimbledon because uh, you know it's it's a Grand Slam. After that, we we stopped with the juniors and moved to the adults to the pros because uh, I felt and my coach also that my game is on that level that I can play with with the big guys. <laughs> Going back to Australia, Novak Djokovic saw that you know you'd broken down, cramped up, and he he, he spoke to you and he invited you to train with him, Montenegro. Tell me. What was it like to train with Novak Djokovic? Yeah, so the the first time was in Belgrade, not in Montenegro. The okay. Montenegro was uh, the second time. After that finals, I uh, spoke to my mental coach because he's also Serbian. He told me that, that his friend is in the part of Nola's team and that he, that he saw, saw me and 
saw the videos and the photos. He also knew that he, he's my idol. So yeah, after like one week, I received a text message uh, with with a video of of him t- talking to me, and I was I was shocked and absolutely didn't know what what was happening. That he knows me, it, it's it was like uh, <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, and that video was like that he inviting me to to practice with him in Belgrade for two or three days just uh, to know him. After one day, Viktor Troitsky ca- called me. I don't know where, where where he get my number, but <laughs> uh, but he called me and uh, uh, ask ask me if uh, I'm uh, free next week. That uh, Nola is in preparation more than he he is looking for a practice partner. If uh, I want to be the part of uh, that preparation, so I was saying, of course I am ready. <laughs> we just packed our bags and uh, go to Belgrade. Yeah, there there I met met Nola and uh, yeah this guy is he's very nice and uh, how he's acting and how he's talking to me it was like I f- felt that he he's my friend at that, at that moment uh, that I can I can ask him uh, whatever I want then we started practicing and I, I, I was the part of his uh, whole day warm-up tennis practice fitness session and recovery everything I saw that uh, how, how these these guys on the tour on these top players are like practicing and uh, doing all these stuff so uh, it was o- also big motivation for me and uh, also the biggest experience I, I have ever 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 seen and yeah, what's one takeaway you learned from being with them where you like that you talk apart from the hard work what what else did you learn from being around Novak the main thing is that the tennis it's not about just tennis <laughs> because all the stuff he, he was practicing uh, the day like only one and a half hour but he he did a good uh, good warm up and good recovery very, very good like uh, the after after session the fitness uh, also the food Every, everything was that perfect just not about tennis but uh, not just on the court but around the court, because it's also very important. And all great champions are, you know, they're, they're really, they care about the little details. How much attention did he put to the small details? All, the, all his attention. He's so good because of these, like, small things. He's putting attention to everything, and that, that's, that's why, why he's the best, yeah. Nice. And and so then you went to, then you're invited to Montenegro also. In Belgrade was the first time and before before the Wimbledon, he, uh, yeah, he invited me in Montenegro for just one week. And then uh, in the next week, he started to preparing for, for Wimbledon. And, but it was on the hard court, not on the grass court. I, I spent there like five days. I met his uh, fitness coach, Marco Pacini. He's from Italia, and that guy is like <laughs> the the god of fitness sessions. Yeah, so all, all the people's uh, people around him are absolutely amazing and very nice. They they were very very helpful. So after this experience, you can can you say you are a much better tennis player and you understand tennis a lot better? Yeah, yeah. Not not just the better player, but also the better person. Nola is very nice guy and very helpful his heck acting on uh, on tennis court that he's a rival and and a monster on that court but uh, of the court he's he's like nicest guys uh, guy i ever met i, I feel that uh, the, these experiences uh, moves move, moves me a lot but also not in my just tennis career but also in my per- person way so yeah nice it's amazing to hear the story from Jakob. When you watch the footage from the final, you can see how much pain Jakob was in, struggling to stand, holding the back of his tie in one hand and his racket in the other hand. Obviously, Novak saw something in Jakob, not giving up even when his body has. A loss like that, so close to winning, could hurt the confidence of a young player, but it doesn't seem to have shaken Jakob. I wonder if that will to win, which is crucial to become a top pro, is what Novak saw and he wanted to show Jakob you can still have a career change of performance without lifting the trophy. This is just a quick reminder you're listening to Functional Tennis, the podcast that helps you get 1% better every day. With me, Fabio Molle. Coming up in the podcast, I asked Jakob how he managed 
Bush's ambition and what the jump from junior to pro was like. Jakob tells me about the time he played with Thomas Burdage as a young kid. But first, I wanted to ask Jakob where he sees his level is now. So, so look, you're moving forward in the right direction. You're learning from Novak. You've played, you know, tournaments this year. Can you say today you're the best version of yourself that there's ever been? I think that uh, there are lots of things that uh, I can uh, do better, not just in tennis, but uh, off, off the court also. When I look uh, directly just on the tennis and all the tennis stuff, we need to improve a uh, lot of things with my coaches and uh, with my team. It's just uh, about the hard work and we put it in and yeah, just focusing on, on the, these these little details. How, how do you, you know, your top, one of the top Czech players, how do you manage expectations from the Czech people, from the Czech Tennis Federation, from your fans that I know you're compared to Thomas Berdych a lot, <laughs> which is, which is, a, which is, you know, it's a high, it's big shoes to fill. How, how do you manage those expectations? To be honest, all this, uh, all this media and the news and uh, everything uh, goes uh, to my parents because they are managing all these, uh, all these things and all these uh, news and everything. So uh, it goes around my head, and I, I'm I'm just trying to focusing on what I'm doing. O- of course, the fans like I like them, and when I when they are supporting me, it's w- w- very good for me. But uh, also very bad things, some hates and after losing the matches or whatever. So I'm just trying to, to focusing that I, I like, I love what I'm doing and uh, I'm putting 100% in everything uh, in tennis. So I'm, I'm just trying to be the best version of myself. Me and my team uh, trust uh, trust in this pro- process. So hopefully uh, this is the good way. Yeah, I'm trying to, to just focus on the good things and not just uh, for the bad things. Yeah, You got all the women as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all the all the great Czech player women like uh, Ethan Krejcikova now playing unbelievable. Like Krejcikova, yeah, yeah, sure. We, we have a lot, lot, lot of good, good girls like uh, Sister Fruvirtovas and uh, also uh, Petra Kvitova is there for a, yeah. on the tour for a long time. She won uh, Wimbledon twice and she's like, it was eight years ago or something like that and she, she's still in the top, top of the the girls tennis so yeah we have a lo- lot of lot of g- good girls now in uh also in in a men's we have uh we have we have uh yiri Ejka now he's uh yeah to, uh just uh he's also the part of this national tennis center so we know each other very well and uh, we are practicing with each other when he's here and when I'm here now Thomas Machac is playing very good we are we are very young so yeah we have a lot of things to do yeah hopefully uh, the stage of uh, men's Czech tennis will go higher and higher <laughs> yeah well you look he's definitely do a good job but uh, the Hex is meant to come on the podcast a while now I'm still waiting for him to book in but he's due to come on soon well he, he was due to come on I haven't heard from him in a while but uh Funny, we posted a video today with his fitness trainer. I'm sure you know Radek. Yeah, Radek Stepanek. I know him very well. I, I was I was uh, I was cooperating with him for a long time, like two or three years, and then we separate because he is now the main uh, fitness coach of uh, Yuri Lehechka. So they are doing great job, and uh, I think after after that, he's now top top fifty. So absolutely, absolutely well done. Yeah, no, definitely good. No, people were saying that that's not Radek Stefanik. They were thinking of the player. Ah, yeah, they were like, like that's not him. I'm like, no, it is him. No, no, <laughs> no. That, that's not the, that's not the player. They have just the same names. But uh, yeah, I, I heard this a lot. Also, you're obviously ambitious. You've big ambitions. How do you manage those that ambition, like from day to day, and make sure you know you're not too eager that you say this is a process here. How do you manage that? Yeah, of course, every every win and every loss uh, is is the process. You know, there are sometimes like uh, good days and bad days. For example, like the middle of uh, last year was that I was a little bit struggling, not with just my tennis, but uh, everything else because I, I didn't play really good. I was losing and losing and um, after that, so we said, hey, it's just the process, you know, we are 
training, we are practicing, we are doing all w- what we can. Someday, just one, one, one bad win, but uh, that pushes you uh, very, very high. And after that moment, it was the last year, the challenger in, in Prague. First round was that I was uh, not playing really good, but somehow I win. Something just flipped and switched in my head and starting to being uh, like better and better every day. After that, I, I, I was in semifinals. And after that, I, I, um, I came to some futures and I won one, two, three. And that, that then I was like, oh my God, just one, one month ago, I, I, I was playing really bad. But after after some some win, good wins, uh, I start I started to realize that it's not just about the winnings, but about ju- also the losing because the loses we I think will push you uh, higher and higher and yeah that's it. So uh, after after every match or not just the match, it can be like practice and uh, whatever. So we just trying to put our best. And yeah, uh, moving and uh, enjoying that that journey. Yeah. <laughs> you you got to get used to the lose, and because uh, it happens most weeks. Yeah, for sure. So you 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 know, you play Aussie Open, get to the final. You play French Open, play Roland Garros. These places are amazing. You're a junior there. You own the place. You feel like a king. What's it like then to make that transition to the to the pro tour, where you know you're playing futures, the odd challenger. Uh, what does it feel like showing up at these places? Was that tough? Was that challenging? Or how do you deal with it? I know now you're more challenger, but it's a bit nicer, but it's it's still not that ATP or slam level. Absolutely, absolutely. Because juniors and pros, it's very, very, very different. Another level. Yeah, the juniors tournaments are really good, but the best tournaments are, of course, the Grand Slams, junior Grand Slams. And when you are on the Grand Slam, you 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 feel that uh, you have everything and uh, yeah that that's the end of of your of your career yeah that's just uh, one tournament one week that you spend there and after after that you move to the futures you you don't know where where you are that the, the, the place uh, it's not not good not not good balls referees and everything is uh, worse than the Grand Slam. I don't want to say that it's the, the worst tournament I ever played, but uh, sometimes on some places and in some countries, it's really, really bad. Also, the players and the pros, the men's, uh, it's a different chapter. Because the juniors, you know that you can just uh, have a break for one game and still you can you can win the set. But in, in the pros, well, not, nothing. Like I, I remember my first tournament, was uh, 15k was in Sharm El Sheikh. I uh, it was uh, after after the Aussie Open, uh, one month after Australian Open, and uh, I felt that I can I can I, I was losing, but I felt that I can beat these guys. But uh, something it's something it's different in in juniors. I felt that I'm a better player, but uh, every point. Which I won. I I must to hit two or three strokes more, and after after a big point, I won the big point, and I thought that uh, these guys will be like, ah, okay, so just like in juniors, one game off, so they they gave me they gave me one game easily, but nothing. They are playing, 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 whatever is happening, and that that that's a dif- difference between between juniors and and pros. And for sure, also the place where you are, because when you are moving from top junior tournaments to to the futures, you felt like, oh my God, you need to start start this journey journey again, and uh, you need to uh, be through these these tournaments. And after that, you you move to the challengers. That it's also something different than futures. And uh, you, they are starting to play more aggressive, and uh, you felt that uh, they are they are really good, not just uh, in their uh, their mentality, but mm-hmm. also in, in in the in the tennis. And I had that uh, opportunity to play uh, 250 ATP in Belgrade last last year, and uh, 
yeah when you are there it's like <laughs> that, that that's what what you're like uh that's why you're playing tennis because you you want to be on these tournaments uh the be the part of of the tour and uh play with the best and uh yeah just uh, be on these tournaments because you have there everything and did you pick up uh the junior players last year who got wild cards into challenges are you part of that group you mean you mean this year or last year was it not was it not last year's no no the, 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 this, this year, year is this year oh. is the first time is the first time when we okay. have the opportunity to receive the wild cards and the promotion spots and on the challengers but last year it, we didn't have that opportunity uh, only only that we have uh three two spots on 15 k's okay. when you are top 100 in juniors you have just two two spots in 15 k's but uh no opportunity to play like the challengers like this year so uh, when uh, my coach told me that uh, i can play this year like the challengers because i will have the spots i was like yeah that that will be much easier and yeah the the journey will will go faster because you know when yeah. you are not just playing and struggling in 50 futures itf tournaments and that you can play on better, these better tournaments it's not just about that uh, if if you win a round that uh, you will have like more points so about the exper- experiences because when you are playing just one or one and a half year just the futures and then you go on challenger you are like oh my god what i'm doing here what what to do now and you are not feeling comfortable like when you played already yeah no. these spots and these opportunities to to play these uh these tournaments it's very helpful and from atp it's like it's like a big gift for for the juniors so do, do you have that this year or you don't have it you personally uh no we we have we have that okay that's good that's good okay yeah I wasn't because sure. i i finished i finished in the year-end ranking i was not like second and i was not in top 10 I was in top top twenty. I finished the year end ranking like eighteen, mm. and uh, that uh, ATP tour j- just told us that uh, the players uh, which which are in top twenty will get these spots. Mm. So if I didn't like have <laughs> the points from, for, for example, from Australian Open. Uh, I will be like free. Yeah, I will just play just the futures and uh, no more like these wild cards in in the challenger. So we, I was very lucky that, that was, uh, I finished the the year in top twenty. That was tight. But I, I look, I think you've done a good job. You won four futures last year. You know, I think you're through that. You're moving through that quickly, which is the important thing because you can get stuck down there for years. Yeah, for That's sure. What you don't absolutely, want. absolutely. Yeah, I remember that last year I talk to my coach and my, my goal for this year is to be in top uh, 800 ATP and he said oh okay that's really good but uh, you know it's uh, very hard after that I, I won few 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 rounds and uh, few tournaments and I was I finished the year like or around 400 uh, I have on the fridge the paper that uh, I want to be at the end of the year top 800 so I just take the stick (laughs) (laughs) and say okay okay i'm not 800 but 400 and also it was big help for me because uh, this year when we have that opportunities to play on challengers and um, also that i have the ranking it's much easier to to get in these tournaments so yeah it's big help our like goals or just uh, the dreams for this year is uh, to be the like good part of of the jo- challenger tour we we want to play these tournaments and uh, go with my ranking higher and higher and uh, for example i i want to be a part of uh, qualifications round in uh, us open this year final question for you jacob uh, what advice do you have for our listeners who want to be one percent better every day just love what they, what they are doing and uh, trying to put everything all the energy and uh, trying to be every day better and better one one percent changes everything so if you are one percent uh, better than 
uh, every day or not just every day in uh, everything what they are doing then you are doing great job and yeah you, you have uh, you have uh, you can you can be uh, you can be there where you want to be actually one more question did you ever play tennis with thomas burdage yeah i played i played because he was playing also he was practicing in this uh, in prosiov in in my hometown every year the the National Tennis Center was, uh, th- they were preparing to the exhibition with uh, with Thomas Berdych and also with the Iwan Landl. So all the little kids and six, five years old, they, they, they had that opportunity to play uh, every year for just one hour with Thomas Berdych and Iwan Landl. I was like six, seven. So I played with him. And uh, I was watching. Uh, I I have also a lo- lo- lot of pictures with him. But uh, when I started to think to be a professional tennis uh, tennis player, he 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 stopped his career. And uh, after that, mm. I realized that I cannot beat him one day. Oh. So <laughs> you can't. I can play him and beat him. Head up to Monaco. Yeah, yeah. he's living the good life now. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, keep up the great work and uh, we we'll keep posting your videos because they're very popular on our page. So uh, thank you very much. Also, thank you very much for everything. See you. That's the end of the podcast for today. Thank you, Jakob, for coming on the show. I'm really excited to see how your career progresses in the future. And I bet we'll be watching all your performance at the very top of the game for many years to come. Thank you for listening. Next week on the podcast, I speak to strength and conditioning coach Andrea Bracaglia. In our conversation, we chat about how Andrea became a strength and conditioning coach, his background in water polo and how fit water polo players have to be, how he got into tennis and his previous experience in football working for the famous Lazio football team. He worked with Diana Yastremska and then he went on to work and is still working with Emil Rusevari and he tells us all how he works with Emil to help him get stronger. So I hope you enjoy the episode and can't wait to share it with you next week. Just a few quick notes before we go. Make sure to follow the show so you get automatically notified about new episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. If you would like to learn more about me or the work we do at Functional Tennis, visit our website at functionaltennis.com. You can also follow the show on Instagram at the Functional Tennis Podcast and with me on Twitter, Fab Mall. This podcast is produced by One Fine Play. James Bishop is the executive producer. Connor Foley is the series producer and editor. I've been your host, Fabio Molle. Thanks for listening to the Functional Tennis Podcast. Thank you.